to all of the HU members are, who are watching this at home, you are the heart of healthcare. Just showing up to work every day during this pandemic shows your courage and commitment. And I especially want to acknowledge our local officers and shop stewards for being such fierce advocates for our members during this public health crisis. I'm really pleased to be hosting tonight's panel on the new economics of the public sector, why we need more public, not less, after COVID. This panel is taking place as part of our facilities bargaining conference, which is planning for our upcoming bargaining with the provincial government. The facilities collective agreement covers approximately 58,000 healthcare workers who are members of 10 different unions. More than 90% are members of the HEU. It's the largest single collective agreement in the public sector. Our members in this agreement, along with nearly 350,000 other public sector workers and their unions are heading to the table in the next few months. And this round of public sector bargaining is taking place against the backdrop of increasing inflation, unprecedented public spending in the face of a global pandemic, and in this province, a big bill as a result of a series of natural disasters linked to our climate emergency. We also know that there is strong public support for investments in public services as a result of the pandemic. And there's also a lot of public support for healthcare and other public service workers because of their role in keeping our community safe during the pandemic. Tonight's panel is an opportunity for us to think about the context we're in as we head to the table. And to help us do that, we are joined by two of Canada's top thinkers and commentators on all things public sector. I'm honoured tonight to be joined by Linda McQuaig and Jim Stanford. And I want to spend a minute telling you a bit about both of them. Linda McQuaig is a best-selling author, journalist and activist. The National Post dubbed her Canada's Michael Moore, and the Globe and Mail called her one of Canada's indispensable public intellectuals. As an investigative reporter for the Globe and Mail, McQuaig won a National Newspaper Award in 1989. As a senior writer for Maclean's magazine, she probed the early business dealings of Conrad Black in two provocative cover stories. Since 2002, she has used her op-ed column in the Toronto Star to challenge the prevailing economic dogma and champion a more equal distribution of wealth and power. She is the author of eight controversial national bestsellers. Her latest book, published in 2019, is A Sport and Prey of Capitalists, How the Rich Are Stealing Canada's Public Wealth. Welcome, Linda. Thanks very much, Mina. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's a, certainly a great honor to be sharing a podium with uh, my wonderful friend, Jim Stanford, who has probably done more to advance progressive economics in this country than anybody I can think of. I mean, his book, Economics for Everyone, is absolutely compulsory reading for anybody interested in really understanding what economics is about. Great. Thank um, you, Linda. I'm just going to introduce Jim, and then I'll oh, get oh, right I'm back sorry. to you. I'm oh. just going to introduce Jim, and then I'll be right back to you. So Jim Stanford is economist and director of the Center for Future Work and is one of Canada's best-known economic commentators. He served for over 20 years as economist and director of policy with Unifor, Canada's largest private sector trade union. He writes a regular column for the Toronto Star and has also served for many years as a research associate and volunteer with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He is also the author of Economics for Everyone, a short guide to the economics of capitalism. We have two copies of Jim and Linda's latest books to give away tonight. One will be for people who comment in the Facebook chat and the others will be for someone attending our conference. So please participate in that Facebook chat and we'll follow up with the winners tomorrow. And now we're going to turn it over to Linda and Jim to share a few thoughts on why we need more public, not less, after COVID. So over to you, Linda, you'll go first. Okay, sorry about that, Mina. I just got a little bit overexcited. 
but I want to I want to say how happy I am to be here and to congratulate the HEU on this reverse privatization that the first stage just began last week. Uh, you know, with the uh, 200 health health workers and food workers uh, being brought back into the public sector. Uh, I mean, this is such an important development, uh, recognizing that workers are entitled to decent wages and decent working conditions. And it's not just about always racing to the bottom. Um, let, let's hope this is the beginning of a, a trend that we're gonna see across the country. Uh, now we're talking tonight about the new economics of the public sector, and I'm going to focus on what I hope will be a key part of the new economics of the public sector, and that is going to be hopefully an end to the obsession with privatization. Uh, you know, privatization has been the economic dogma of our times. I mean, it's it's, it's all about celebrating the private sector and demonizing the public sector. And I probably don't have to tell anybody listening to this about that demonization of the public sector. But I, I particularly choose the word dogma uh, because the, the dogma of privatization, by that I mean that it's, a, it's considered a truth which is never challenged, never questioned. You know, we constantly hear people, government and media people, assert that the private sector does things better, does things more efficiently. Uh, but they say that, but they never provide any proof. It's just considered a self-evident truth. You know, it's considered self-evident that the government and the public sector should therefore be reduced to as small a size as possible. I, 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 there was the horrible American uh, political activist, uh, Gro Grover Norquist once put it this way, he said, uh, government should be small enough that it can be drowned in a bathtub. I mean, among other things, it just shows the kind of hostility that they're trying to engender towards the, towards the public sector. And I think it's important that we recognize that this celebration of the, of the private sector that we've seen for so much, so long now, that, that it's a very American phenomenon. It's, it's not part of our Canadian tradition. Uh, I mean, the U.S. has has really always excelled at private enterprise. You know, they, they develop big corporations that dominate the global economy. Canada, on the other hand, was never particularly good at private enterprise. I mean, whenever a Canadian company succeeded, it was quickly bought up, by, bought up and taken over by an American company. So we've ended up with kind of a, a branch plant economy. But the important thing is that Canada did excel at public enterprise and public programs. I mean, Canada has a really impressive history of public programs and enterprise that we don't celebrate. Uh, you know, we developed uh, public, publicly owned power plants across the country, a national railway, a public broadcaster, a public pharmaceutical company public banks, public infrastructure, and of course, uh, strong public health care and education systems. And, and that emphasis on the public domain has helped make Canada a much more egalitarian and inc inclusive country. And of course, you can see this vividly if you look at the U.S. health care and education systems that are so much more privatized and elitist. Uh, and yet, tragically, in recent years, this great Canadian tradition focused on the public domain has really been dismantled. I mean, first of all, governments have so underfunded the public sector, and then they've proceeded to privatize big chunks of it. And that all that does is make us 
more like the United States, less egalitarian, more elitist, which is exactly, of course, what we don't want. Uh, now, I would say that it's important that we, that we identify the difference between the public and the private sector in terms of what their fundamental goals are, because they're very different. I mean, the public sector, I mean, its goal is pretty basic, to serve the public. That's its mandate. And public sector workers take that seriously. I mean, I think you can see that in the dedication, certainly that healthcare workers have shown uh, during the pandemic, being willing to put their lives at risk in order to carry out their jobs. Um, whereas the private sector, on the other hand, um, has no focus on the public good or the public interest. In fact, it has only one goal. And that goal is to deliver profit to shareholders. Uh, that's it, that's it, that's, that's, all, that's, all, that's all it's about, that's the goal. And if you think that's just me being nasty or critical of, of the private sector, that's not true. It, the corporation is just about uh, delivering profit to shareholders, that's in the corporate law. Now, of course, corporations often pretend that they care about things in the public interest. You know, oil companies pretend they care about climate change, et cetera, because that's good for public relations. I mean, that makes the public like them, and then people are more likely to buy their products, and then they can make more profits, which they can deliver to their shareholders, which is all they're about. Um, so, but when you think about it, given this intense focus on profits and profits alone in the private sector, it seems crazy that, you know, that we get the private sector to provide services to vulnerable people, uh, you know, because we know they'll cut corners as much as they can. They'll cut to the bone. And we've seen this amply in illustrate, of course, in the horrific situation with long-term care homes during the pandemic. And I think the BC story around long-term care is an interesting one because for decades, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were unionization drives, the uh, government reforms, and all that led up to this master collective agreement that applied to all LTC workers, and which was really a terrific thing because it provided an excellent standard of good wages, good working conditions, uh, and, and prevented workers from, uh, you know, having to shift all about to try and get a better wage somewhere else. It was a standard collective agreement for everyone. Um, and that was a terrific model, but sadly, as we know, in 2001, with the new liberal government in place, um, they brought in Bill 29, uh, allowing companies to opt out of, you know, of, of the, the master collective agreement. And of course, what that ended up with was we got all these corporate cha chains um, that, of course, were terrible in terms of working conditions and uh, just basically providing no decent standard of work standard for, for their employees. Um, now, in 2017, it was very exciting that the NDP repealed Bill 29. Um, and of course, only last week, we see the, the fruits of that with the, the first 200 workers, uh, you know, being, uh, what's the word, being re repatriated, repatriated. Um, and I just want to very quickly mention the situation in Ontario. Um, it, it, it's, it's somewhat similar uh, but without the happy ending that, that BC is having or is starting to have, 
Uh, and that is that Mike Harris, uh, around the same time as, uh, as, as you know, the liberals in, in 2001, Mike Harris was uh, encouraging the privatization of long-term care homes in Ontario. Uh, and he actually, you know, removed the minimum staff requirement at the homes and made LTCs, you know, very, very lucrative uh, as private opportunities for business. And so, soon what happened was the, the LTC industry was dominated by corporate chains. Uh, and Mike Harris, the premier, uh, uh, resigned shortly after that amid a bit of a scandal um, and became chairman of Chartwell, you know, one of the big long-term care uh, facilities, a pri private operation. Uh, and Harris had a $250,000 a year part-time job as chairman of, of, of Chartwell and had stock options worth worth millions. Uh, and the result of this was has been tragic. I mean, the, as a result, you know, we've ended up in the, the pandemic with just terrible results in our long-term care homes. In, in Ontario, for instance, there have been 3,800 deaths in long-term care homes. Uh, just a, a devastating, devastating number. Uh, so the pandemic uh, really, I would say, exposed uh, the deficiencies in the private sector, not just in long-term care, but, uh, you know, in, in, in other ways as well. I mean, where is the, the private sector when you need it in a pandemic? The private sector just closes its doors and uh, basically, it's only about profit. It just lays people off. Uh, you know, without strong government, uh, Canadians uh, would have been that much worse off during the pandemic, for instance. Uh, Canadians have come to appreciate uh, the importance of big government through the experience of the pandemic. And the Trudeau government, I would say, you know, understands this and uh, understands that Canadians want strong government supports. And, and that's, of course, why, uh, you know, they've done the CERB and a whole bunch of programs and also uh, made investments in, in, in child care. Uh, but at the same time, the Trudeau government has been so keen to please business interests um, and deliver privatization. And Trudeau has made massive plans to basically privatize Canada's infrastructure. And that's why uh, Trudeau created the Canada Infrastructure Bank, or CIB. Uh, you know, the, the, the vast majority of our infrastructure is publicly owned, as it should be. But the CIB, this new bank that Trudeau set up, will change that. I mean, the CIB ostensibly was set up to help municipal and uh, provincial governments finance infrastructure projects. Um, but, but, but doing it with private partners, um, you know, the, the idea was to set up these infrastructure deals with private partners, but we don't need private partners. In fact, traditionally, municipalities and provinces have built their own infrastructure uh, without private partners, and, and it's been very successful. Uh, and by bringing in private partners, ultimately all that does is drive up the costs and lead municipalities, municipalities with little control. Uh, but if mun municipalities don't want to partner with the private sector, the CIB won't help them at all. I mean, I'll just quickly give you an example because that's what happened to a small township in Mapleton, Ontario. Um, Mapleton wanted to upgrade its water and wastewater systems. Uh, so the CIB, this uh, public bank, 
offered $20 million of financial support for a P3 deal with the private partner uh, and Mapleton. Uh, but the Mapleton Town Council, when they got to study the deal, they realized it was actually a terrible deal, even with the $20 million thrown in by the government. Because it's not a good deal because so much, in fact, virtually all that money ends up going to the private partner. So the, the town decided it would be cheaper and better to do a project itself in the traditional way without this involvement of the bank. So it walked away from the deal, losing the $20 million in financial support from the bank. Because under the CIB, under the, the uh, Canadian Infrastructure Bank's rules, if you have no private partner involved, there's no support. There's no interest in just supporting uh, the public sector and, and the needs of the people. But, you know, so in fact, all that Mapleton was left with was a $300,000 legal bill, uh, <laughs> which they got uh, trying to get out of this deal. But hold it. I mean, when you think about it, the CIBC is operating with public money, taxpayer dollars. So why is it providing $20 million in financial support to essentially to private developers, but it's not willing to offer that to the people of Mapleton if they won't partner with the, with the private developers? I mean, this is outrageous. And this is what the Trudeau government is doing to our infrastructure. So in conclusion, I just want to make the point that Canada has a proud public tradition uh, that we rarely celebrate. Instead of our uh, think tanks and media, instead of the think tanks and media that we're constantly bombarded with, we don't hear about this strong public tradition from them. Instead, we hear a lot of hooey about the superiority of the, of the private sector. And I would argue that the truth is the public sector has served this country very well and that the public knows it uh, and has kind of really come to understand that, particularly because of the pandemic. So I would argue that it's time we stopped lionizing the private sector and it's time we started uh, you know, demanding that the government stop shrinking the public sector and instead actually started expanding the public sector. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Linda. That was uh, really interesting. And I agree that Canada excels at uh, public programs and services. And I'm sure that uh, what you've shared will be really helpful for healthcare workers uh, to hear. I now want to turn it over to Jim to share some of his thoughts. So over to you, Jim. Mina, thank you very much. It's a great honour for me to join you and all the fighting members uh, of the HEU at this uh, bargaining conference. What, a, what an incredible time your union has had uh, through the, this terrible challenge of uh, the pandemic and uh, some amazing uh, victories that you've won despite the challenges uh, around that. Uh, including the single site staffing and the, the wages that were paid of that. And now, of course, this incredible repatriation of work uh, back into public sector provision. And uh, I'm just in awe at uh, the groundwork that the HEU uh, has done from top to bottom, the, the activists in every workplace, the, uh, the stewards, the trainers, uh, and of course, the leaders, uh, and the, the sustained uh, pressure that you put on the politicians, the sustained education and communications that you've uh, put into telling the story uh, to British Columbians about the importance of uh, healthcare and doing it right and doing it for the public. And, and now you've got uh, something historic to show for it. I, I really believe that this repatriation victory will be globally significant. Uh, I've been watching, as I know Linda has, uh, fights uh, against privatization and to roll back privatization happening uh, around the world. And they're having some success. Uh, Germany is uh, um, repatriating uh, utilities at the municipal level. Uh, Britain is repatriating the train system because it turned out that private ownership was a disaster. 
um, progressive governments in Latin America are repatriating public ownership of resources. And I think that this uh, victory of yours, uh, Mina, and your unions here in BC is going to uh, rank uh, with those uh, when the story is told about how the tide of privatization was changed, uh, not just in one workplace and one community, but around the world. Uh, so uh, thank you for what you're what you're doing. Uh, you're literally making history. I believe that. Uh, I'm also just thrilled to join uh, my friend Linda McQuaig on this panel. Linda is just an outstanding uh, voice for for progressive values in Canada. Uh, you know, I I'm an economist, so I love to get down with my spreadsheets and my regressions and all my numbers. Uh, but Linda has a way of taking those numbers uh, and just telling a story uh, with them that uh, just can't be denied and uh, has been exposing the hypocrisy in irrationality and waste. Uh, of uh, the private sector uh, for years and years and years, and uh, and in a way, I think has laid the groundwork uh, for some of these victories that the ATU is uh, is winning. So, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the numbers, some of the facts and figures around the economics of the public sector, and I am going to share a, a few slides. Perhaps your uh, tech team could uh, pull up the um, uh, the slides there. Thank you very much. Uh, I should give a fair warning. I am an economist, so I, I've got some numbers and charts. I, I'll try to. Uh, I'll try to make them accessible, but uh, they do say that an economist is someone who's good with numbers, but didn't have the personality to become an accountant. Uh, okay, so I'll just give you kind of fair warning uh, on that score. Um, and by the way, here is our uh, website for our Center for Future Work, our, our Canadian office, which is based in Vancouver, and my Twitter handle and our Center's Twitter handle. You're welcome to post uh, from this presentation uh, if you'd like. Uh, what a moment, uh, in a way, um, the COVID-19 pandemic was for people's attitudes towards government and public services and public wealth. Um, Canadians obviously were grateful the government was there to protect them uh, in this catastrophe, including obviously overseeing the necessary uh, health uh, measures and distancing restrictions and uh, development and distribution of the vaccines uh, and so on. Um, also, uh, Canadians uh, unanimously recognized the value of the essential work that was done by HEU members and, and many others, not just in healthcare. Of course, healthcare is frontline in a pandemic, but what about all the other essential jobs that were done in our society from, you know, checkout cashiers at the grocery store when we weren't sure we'd be able to get food and toilet paper uh, to people delivering our fast food to us, to cleaners and carers. Um, government mobilized enormous resources on the spur of the moment uh, to meet those needs. Uh, nobody in the middle of this pandemic said, "We, you know, Canada really needs Canada really needs a smaller government, small enough to drown in a bathtub." As Linda was saying, people were grateful we had big, powerful, strong, innovative, well-funded government uh, to get us through this. And so the question now, I mean, pan the pandemic isn't over. Of course, uh, we're still dealing with new variants, and we've still got lots of rebuilding to do, but. Uh, this reaffirmation of the important role of government, is it an aberration or is it something that will last? And I think it is something uh, that will last. Uh, lots of uh, economic evidence to show why having a strong, substantial public sector and good paying, stable jobs that go with it were really, really vital in helping uh, BC and helping Canada through this uh, pandemic. Public sector jobs were far more stable than jobs in the private sector. As Linda says, you know, when the going gets tough, uh, private businesses will shut down if their bottom line is being hurt. Governments don't do that because governments aren't there to maximize the bottom line. Governments are there to provide a service that uh, citizens mandate them to survive. Uh, so that helped to stabilize overall employment when uh, we needed it most. And those public sector jobs, as we all know, as HEU knows, you've been fighting to preserve this. Uh, public sector jobs are better jobs. Uh, they're more stable. They're safer, uh, as we've seen, and obviously long-term care, as uh, as Linda mentioned. Uh, they pay better, and they have representation uh, from uh, union reps. And, of course, the services that public sector workers delivered were, were absolutely vital. It's not just that they were good jobs. It's the work that was being done um, was absolutely vital uh, to protecting us from the pandemic. So just one indication, in the first months of the, of the pandemic, the first uh, two months of the pandemic, uh, private sector employment in Canada fell by 22% in two months. Public sector employment fell as well, um, but not nearly to the same uh, degree, by about one quarter as much. So even in the worst moments of the pandemic, the public sector was an oasis of uh, stability. Then, in the period since then, we have regained all of the jobs that were initially lost in the public sector, and then some. So public sector employment is above where it was now, where the pandemic hit.
uh, private sector employees, that is waged workers in the private sector, have only just got back to where they were before the pandemic hit, and self-employment is still down. So uh, again, this is an evident evidence that the public sector plays a vital stabilizing role, not just during the downturn, but also in leading the reconstruction after uh, the initial uh, pandemic hit. And this is uh, contrary, completely contrary to that uh, misguided ideology that Linda um, was deconstructing, that the public sector is wasteful, that the private sector creates wealth and the public sector spends wealth. That isn't it at all. Uh, the work that goes on in the public sector is vital. It delivers essential services and it adds to GDP, by the way. It adds to income. It generates tax revenue uh, for governments. All of the things that uh, private sector uh, firms are supposedly celebrated for, the public sector does and does it better during uh, a downturn. And this is part of uh, what I would call the, this moment where we can change the, the framework, change the narrative uh, in terms of how we understand the private sector and the public sector. The old ideas that the private sector is more efficient, the government was put on earth to balance the budget, and that's the sign of whether the government is doing its job well, is whether it balances the budget. You could just go out of business as the government. Then you have zero revenue, zero expenses, and that would be a balanced budget. Is that what government is for? Uh, of course not. Uh, and that somehow voters will uh, pub uh, punish governments that are seen as spendthrift uh, or, or wasting. All of that uh, was proven wrong. Uh, the public sector was efficient. The public sector was innovative. The public sector delivered new services and new programs uh, invented uh, in weeks and delivered it well uh, to help us through. And everyone in, in the public service demand de deserves a, uh, our thanks and recognition uh, for the courage and innovation with which they did their jobs uh, through this uh, pandemic. The other thing that's shifted why I think that there's a new economics of the public sector and why deficits are less of a, a thing, uh, including in politics, uh, than they used to be. Uh, interest rates are much lower uh, these days than they were 20 or 30 years ago, and, and for good reason. They never should have been as high as they were 20 or 30 years ago. And part of the reason they're very low now is because of the damage that high interest rates did in the past uh, to our economy and others around the world. But with interest rates being as low as they are, you know, a government like BC can issue interest, uh, can issue bonds and pay about two or two and a half percent interest uh, on those bonds. It means that uh, deficits and the debt that comes with it uh, are, are entirely manageable. Uh, the cost of servicing that debt uh, in terms of interest payments uh, is a fraction, and I'll show you uh, a small fraction of what it used to be. Moreover, when interest rates are that low, Generally, the economy, and except in years when a recession hits, like 2020, but in most other years, the economy will be growing faster than the interest rate. And when the rate of economic growth is faster than the rate at which you're paying interest on the debt, this is just pure math, uh, it means that the debt burden as a share of GDP will automatically shrink. So even mainstream economists, people you wouldn't consider to be left-wing radicals, even mainstream economists in recent years, especially in the decades since the global financial crisis in 2008, and now the COVID crisis, uh, a decade and some later, uh, mainstream economists recognize that deficits are actually, you know, not just not the evil incarnate that they were portrayed, but in fact are helpful and useful and a good thing. They actually strengthen the economy as we go through. Moreover, this idea that the government is in debt uh, but the private sector is uh, efficient and all-knowing, you know, is also false because it's not just the government that takes on debt. Governments do take on debt, and particularly when they take on debt to finance long-lasting assets, whether that's a hospital or a bridge or a school or uh, as any of our physical or social infrastructure, when they take on debt to, for a long-term asset, that's actually a logical, productive thing to do. Households also take on debt, and it's a good thing they do. Otherwise, none of them, no one could ever buy a house or a car. Businesses take on debt all the time uh, in order to finance new investments. In fact, the debt of the private sector, whether it's households or private businesses, is far larger than the debt of the public sector. So this idea that the public sector debt is an evil thing that the government should commit to getting rid of uh, is nonsensical. If you were the CEO of a company, and you went to the annual general shareholders meeting and spoke like one of these politicians and said, well, Ma and Pa, they know they sit there at the kitchen table. They've got to uh, balance their budget. They can't spend more than they take in. My first priority as CEO will be to eliminate 
this company's dead. The shareholders would throw that guy out on the street in 10 minutes because they'd say, who is this idiot? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yet those same kind of mythological ideas are taken at face value when we're dealing with public deficits and public uh, finances. The reality is governments do not have to balance their budgets, and neither do households or corporations, by the way. Uh, when you uh, particularly are financing uh, long-lasting productive assets like infrastructure and social investments, they make sense. And in tough times, uh, you use deficits for everything the government does, and that makes sense as well. And it turns out, you know, uh, our federal government could run up a deficit of $380 billion in 2020, and nobody batted an eye. So this old idea that you can't do anything because there just isn't money in the government's piggy bank, nonsense. Hooey, hooey is what Linda called it uh, a little earlier when she was talking about all the hooey about how the private sector is better. I have another term for it in, in economics, it's called bullshit. That's a technical term in economics, Mina, forgive me. Uh, it means hypothesis unsubstantiated by empirical verification, okay? Uh, so it's hooey. Uh, or bullshit, this idea that government uh, has to balance the budget. Even provincial governments, which do not have the same flexibility as a national government, that's clear, but even provincial governments don't have to balance their budget uh, year after year. Uh, they have to maintain debt that's manageable and stable as a share of GDP, and they have to look at the interest cost on the debt. So let's look at some of the data about the size of these things. Here's the federal deficit. Okay, we've had a deficit most years since the end of World War II, yet the debt burden actually shrank as a share of GDP because of what I said earlier, the economy was growing fast. We had a surplus, that's the black bars for a few years. That's when Paul Martin was the, uh, prime, the finance minister and made a virtue out of balancing the budget as if that was the goal of government, nonsense. Then we've had deficits every year since, a huge one during COVID. But the expectation is those deficits will get back to entirely manageable levels uh, within the next two years, really. Uh, the federal debt uh, as a share of GDP uh, rose in the 80s, uh, declined dramatically under Paul Martin and then under Stephen Harper with all of the austerity and the cutbacks, jumped up during the pandemic. That's what that uh, steep bit at the right-hand side of the graph is. But then is already falling. This year, the federal debt will fall. Why? Because the economy is going to grow 6 or 7% this year, and the debt is not going to grow nearly as fast. This is the kicker. This is how much of the economy is spent on uh, federal interest charges. So this is the interest payments on the federal debt, and it's a fraction. I said a small fraction, 1% of GDP, and it actually fell uh, last year, despite the new debt that was taken on to pay for the pandemic, because interest rates fell even lower. So the federal government is paying 1%, sometimes less, on its interest on new bonds that it issues, uh, which means all of that money that was spent, whether it was on income supports like CERB or uh, payments to the provinces to help with some of the health consequences of the pandemic uh, or other uh, projects like climate change or infrastructure, all of the interest on that uh, actually shrank as a share of our GDP. It will, they think it will increase a bit in the next couple of years if interest rates start to rise again, but uh, not by very much. This is not a debt crisis, okay? Everyone is wringing their hands, uh, all of the conservatives, Pierre Polyev and Aaron O'Toole and uh, the National Post columnists saying we're in a debt crisis. That, that is not a debt crisis. Uh, uh, we've never been in a debt crisis and we're certainly not in one now. Uh, the same basic math is true in the provincial level. And I know it's mostly the provincial government that you deal with in your uh, facilities bargaining. Uh, so this shows the uh, share of BC's economy that is uh, uh, allocated to interest payments on the provincial debt. And it has declined dramatically over the last generation, uh, over the last 35, 40 years uh, as well, uh, to uh, less than 0.6% of provincial GDP. And it fell last year as well, even though the provincial deficit, and I know that you know even our friends in, in the NDP government have, I think, been unduly obsessed with the need to balance the budget, mostly for political optics, I would argue, rather than for economic reasons. Uh, but uh, even they uh, had a huge deficit uh, this past year, not as big as they thought it was going to be, yet interest payments shrank as a share of the economy. Go figure. Okay, so no debt crisis there. There was the anticipated deficit for uh, the current uh, fiscal year, the 21-22 fiscal year, almost $10 billion. The latest forecast says it will be half that size, 
And in the end, it's probably going to be less, uh, despite some of the extra costs that we've seen because of the forest fires and the now the floods. Um, interesting, BC's net provincial debt as a share of GDP, uh, among the smallest of any province uh, in Canada. So the blue line shows the last year before COVID, the red bars show uh, with COVID, and of course, every province had a deficit, a big deficit from COVID. Um, but uh, BC uh, is now actually the second smallest of any province next to Saskatchewan. Um, Alberta used to be the lowest, but they had a huge deficit, um, in part because of the mismanagement of the pandemic by Jason Kenney and uh, his efforts to put the economy ahead of public health actually backfired and the economy did worse. Uh, so uh, by historical standards and, and interprovincial standards, BC's fiscal situation is very strong. And the main reason is, is because BC's economy is strong. Uh, employment in BC uh, is now almost 2% higher than it was before COVID hit. And this is testimony to the uh, success of the whole healthcare apparatus, including your members, uh, getting COVID under control, because that's what was essential to preserve the economy, and the benefits of public investment in infrastructure and services, including things like repatriating those jobs uh, for your members. So uh, an active, ambitious, expanding public sector is good, good for the economy, good for GDP, good for government revenues, uh, and it also helps to keep the fiscal situation in order because more people are working, more people are paying taxes, and the deficit ends up being half the size that it was uh, expected to be. So this point that the um, when the economy is growing faster than the interest on the debt is really important to keep in mind because this is going to be true big time uh, over the next coming years. And this is another reason why uh, in the new economics of the public sector, um, we don't have to worry about the debt even with the pandemic. The interest rate is 2%. Uh, growth uh, in BC will be at least 6% this year, probably higher. Uh, so the government can continue to run a deficit. We don't have to accept the idea that they have to get back to balance. And, and I know there's debates going on within the government over this point, but we should be very firm saying, no, the first responsibility is um, to protect people's health, protect their jobs, to protect our environment. Um, and uh, the, that's the best way. Uh, to get out of this. Um, what if interest rates rise? Well, this is a good question. We don't want them to rise. The interest rates are set by the Bank of Canada, so we actually have collectively some control over this. And the reality is the Bank of Canada understands if they jacked up interest rates, um, all kinds of things would happen. Households and businesses would be in crisis long before uh, governments would. So this is why I think that investments in the human and physical infrastructure of this province are very, very important, and they should be bigger, not smaller, as is the theme of this uh, panel. This shows how much the provincial government has been investing in capital spending. Uh, some of it's directly from the government. Some of it is through self-supporting crown corporations like BC Hydro. And to their credit, since the NDP came in, they have increased uh, public investment significantly. But I think they can and should increase it uh, even more. Uh, BC's fiscal position, like the federal government's fiscal position, very strong. By those key indicators, even though we've got a deficit now, the fiscal situation is better than it was in the past because interest charges are so low and the debt is low as a share of GDP. And if we allow the uh, ideology of austerity to creep back in, supported by this false claim that the private sector knows best, the private sector does not know best. Uh, then we will um, uh, undo the good that's been done and create more suffering uh, down the road. This is the moment for more public sector, more investment in social and physical infrastructure and public services like your brave members produce. So I'll leave it at that, Mina. Thank you very much. And I look forward to our discussion. Great. Thank you, Jim. I know HU members will appreciate hearing your insights into the value of the public sector and the work they do every day. Before I go to questions, I just want to welcome more than 150 HU members attending our facilities bargaining conference on the Chime Live platform, plus our members and other members of the community on Facebook and on YouTube. Now, I have some questions now for each of you, and the first question will be for Linda. HU has a long history of bargaining all sorts of language over the decades in our facilities collective agreement to protect skills and job security through a labor adjustment process. 
to create an agency that looks after the health and safety of healthcare workers. And more recently, we bargain language to reverse privatization and bring workers back into the public sector. What has the experience been elsewhere and why is it important to bargain those kinds of programs and processes to preserve the public sector? Linda. Okay, uh, interesting question. Um, you know, the, 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 the importance of reversing these privatizations is, cannot be overstated. Uh, I think Jim has, you know, made that extremely clear. Uh, and, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, the, the NDP government here is clearly bucking the major North American trend, which is towards more privatization. I mean, even as, as I was trying to argue, the Trudeau government is further privatizing our, our infrastructure system. So the NDP is really kind of standing quite, you know, quite bravely on this, I would say. Um, but as, of course, Jim has pointed out, the whole pandemic situation has really exposed how uh, fallacious all the typical arguments are. The, uh, you know, the, for years we thought we couldn't get, uh, we couldn't have the, the programs we wanted because we had so we had such big deficits, and yet look at what we we're now. Our deficits are dozens of times bigger than, than what they were before. And nobody seems to think it's a problem at all. International investors aren't cutting us off. We're not hitting any debt wall. Uh, so I think, you know, we, we've really seen that there's so much, there's so much to what the, the right wing argues that is just utterly fallacious. Um, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, there are other cases across the country where, where this kind of repatriation is happening. And there's different, I think uh, QP has identified about 35 in the last decade or so. Uh, and, and there are different stages of progress. Uh, I think it's clear, though, that unions have, have really had to work extremely hard to pressure governments uh, both at the municipal and provincial level to engage in this repatriation. There's so much pressure from the business community, uh, you know, pushing for, to keep privatization, to have more privatization, to go against that brain takes real courage and it takes real effort on the part of unions to push that, push that agenda. Uh, just quickly, if I could just mention uh, Winnipeg, for instance, um, they contracted out their waste management services in two 2006, uh, privatized them. It was a complete, it's been a complete disaster. They, the contractor then subcontracted out even to like individual trucks. Uh, pay was slashed, terrible. Uh, QP then has worked extremely hard, very closely with sympathetic city councillors in Winnipeg. Um, and now they have a, a, a pilot project going uh, in Winnipeg to, uh, to, for repatriation of that contract. Um, in, in just a, a different sort of example, in Tabor, Alberta, uh, in 2007, they contracted out the town's water uh, in a 20-year contract. Uh, and, and then in 2015, the, the contractor, the you know, private contractor, decided that they wanted more money. So they demanded a 70% increase in the contract in fees. Uh, fortunately, CUPE got involved, calculations were done, it was clear that it would be much better to go the public route. Uh, and so, in fact, that's, that's what the town ended up doing. Workers are now in Tabor. Uh, they're now in the water sector, fully employed by the town uh, and belonging to CUPE. So that, that is a really significant victory. And furthermore, it's resulted in a big savings for the town 
Uh, and there was no penalty for canceling the contract. And I'll just end with the importance that shows of in your bargaining to get protections around contracting out and cancellation of contracts. Uh, because even if the current government is sympathetic, you know, certainly the next one might not be. Great. Thanks, uh, Linda, for your comments. It shows there is amazing worker power that can be achieved at the bargaining table. And now a question uh, for you, Jim. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the BCNDP provincial government invested a lot in public health measures and income support programs. For example, our union led negotiations with government to secure leveled up pay for all workers in long-term care. This represented $165 million annually for workers in this sector. This was a significant victory for our members and something that the NDP government has committed to maintain post-pandemic. But given the climate emergency that we now find ourselves in and that government will need to make massive investments in infrastructure repair and adaptation, with all of these spending pressures and competing priorities for government, what's the best argument for investing in healthcare workers? Jim? Oh, that's a great question, Mina. And again, it just highlights the spectacular success of your union in uh, defending your members, but also defending the people your members care for uh, as that pandemic unfolded. And uh, BC led the way with the uh, single site staffing and then the leveling up uh, on the wages. And uh, frankly, uh, it's something we should have done before the pandemic. You know, the uh, creation of uh, precarious work models in a sector like long-term care um, posed all kinds of risks to workers and, and their clients and the, their families and the homes where they worked um, long before we'd ever heard of COVID-19. So uh, in a way, this was a wake-up call, but full credit to, to the NDP government here for moving on it quickly and set the, set the uh, benchmark, if you like, for other provinces to follow. Now it's going to be vital that we preserve that as an ongoing practice rather than, you know, while that was an emergency, now COVID is done. It isn't done, but when it is done, people will say COVID's done. Let's get back to the way it was before. And that would just be a recipe for disaster, uh, of course. So the, the question is, you know, can the BC government afford $125 million continue to pay that? And the answer is absolutely it can. Uh, BC is one of the richest provinces in one of the richest countries of the world. Uh, we've got more than uh, enough fiscal capacity to do that in long-term care and, by the way, uh, to level up wages in other vital services that have been degraded by outsourcing and downward competition uh, and so on. And uh, we can do it in part on the basis of taxes that we collect in a fair way from people in BC and also recognizing, uh, as I went through in the presentation, uh, uh, BC does not have to balance its budget every year. It doesn't make sense for a government to balance its budget every year in the same way that it doesn't make sense for the household sector or the business sector uh, to do that. So uh, in order to preserve the, that important victory, I think we're going to have to push hard uh, around this idea that the old um, knee-jerk arguments about balancing the budget uh, don't apply anymore. And this really is an investment. It will cost the government and society far, far, far more down the road if we go back to a model of precarious outsourced care delivery that contributes to another pandemic down the road. That will be far, far more expensive uh, than treating healthcare workers now with the uh, respect uh, and fairness that they deserve. Thank you, Jim. I did have a number of other questions, but unfortunately we've come to uh, the end of our time. This was really, truly a fascinating discussion tonight, and I really want to thank Jim and Linda for being here tonight. Thanks uh, to both of you. I know all of the healthcare workers tuning in really appreciate your insights into this importance, in this importance, the importance of the public sector. And to our HEU members tuning in, thank you for being part of this special event, and have a great night.